welcome to pratidwani where we try to humanize science this is episode number 8 where we will discuss about the fascinating history of laser invention what you'll hear in this particular podcast is the fascinating human story of laser invention and uh, you will l- see how one of the most utilized scientific tool in this particular age has emerged uh, and how this particular progress has played a very critical role in various different applications mainly the intensity in which the scientific research was performed during a particular period of time especially just around the cold war era really led to some immaculate kind of uh, uh, research which uh, further gave us this great tool which we use for various different applications and also is one of the most powerful tools to perform basic science research there is also a very interesting race associated uh, with the invention of laser there is a fascinating history of how uh, various different researchers especially within usa played a critical role in development of uh, lasers and how it uh, turned out to be one of the most important uh, scientific achievements of uh, 1900s and it still has very deep implication in how we uh, use that particular tool even to today there are very interesting characters associated with uh, the laser development that is something i'm going to uh, discuss in detail and uh, it also gives you a very interesting insight into how american system works and how academia and industry goes hand in hand and how they coordinate and how they sometimes compete with each other and what interesting developments emerge out of that interaction is also something uh, we're going to look into so first things first uh, let's try to understand what is a laser so a simple definition uh, is that laser is a coherent source and uh, it is in contrast to let's say a normal source let's say like a tube light or a bulb or let's say even sunlight which is incoherent light the light which emerges out of a laser beam generally is of single wavelength and it also has a phase relationship which is very well defined which makes it something called as coherent in contrast to let's say conventional light systems or light sources the laser light has uh, this very important uh, kind of property where it can be used for various different applications uh, where the coherence plays a critical role the acronym laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation and this is an important acronym because you will see there is also an associated acronym which is called as maser which is uh, microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation which is the earlier invention which predates the invention of laser and played an important foundation to to come up with this uh, uh, laser uh, kind of uh, invention the basic concept uh, related to laser has to do with uh, light sources as you probably would be aware of uh, there is something called as electromagnetic spectrum so for example you may have heard am band radio which essentially has specific kind of frequency roughly about uh, uh, 1 megahertz to uh, 10 kilohertz uh, so that particular range within which you would be able to get some very interesting sound where there is a narrow band within that particular uh, frequencies can be characterized as let's say amplitude modulated band radio or it can be let's say radio waves or a microwaves which are equally important uh, kind of uh, frequencies for let's say your mobile phone operations and uh, the light which is visible to human uh, perception is something usually called as a visible light and uh, that particular wavelength uh, spans roughly about uh, 300 400 nanometers to all the way to around 800 nanometers and that particular band of uh, wavelength happens to also be extremely important and uh, generally lasers are termed as light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation because the light what we are talking about is essentially in this visible region you can also go to higher frequencies like ultraviolet and x-rays 
uh, and gamma rays etc so this is a whole span of electromagnetic spectrum which plays a very critical role in uh, various different uh, kind of processes physical processes and our universe the observable universe is essentially through these particular uh, electromagnetic spectra which is uh, very very interesting this podcast also highlights uh, some interesting people people who had a lot of ideas people who articulated those ideas in the form of papers and who uh, wrote up patent articles fought for patent articles and later on went on to uh, invent devices and uh, also some of them ended up winning nobel prizes too and uh, not all of the people involved in this particular story have similar kind of background or similar kind of mindset and you will see there is some very interesting uh, history behind all the people who are involved so what are my sources for this particular podcast i have mainly uh, referred to a fantastic uh, uh, article and uh, a book written by jeff hecht uh, jeff hecht is a very renowned scientific writer and a science historian and uh, he has written a lot about uh, uh, various different aspects of light especially laser light and he's a very well known author who has also written some very interesting books on uh, lasers and on fiber optics and etc i'll be anyway um, citing those sources in my show notes so if somebody is interested please have a look at it uh, so the short history of laser development is one article i have referred to there's also a fantastic book written by jeff hecht uh, and the title of the book is beam the race to make the laser Uh, it's from oxford university press it is one of the best books written on the history of laser and most of my sources are from this these two uh, kind of uh, key um, book and uh, and an article there's also a very interesting um, memoir uh, the laser inventor by uh, one of the uh, important people in this whole uh, story uh, theodore maimon who uh, ended up actually claiming the uh, first person to have uh, kind of produced a working laser and uh, there's also of course uh, a very important uh, chronicle of how the laser happened adventures of a scientist by the most important person in the context of the development of ideas that is charles towns charles towns probably may uh, be one of the greatest experimental physicists to work during the uh, cold war period and uh, he uh, invented so many interesting ideas and also was the person who ended up nobel prize for the invention of uh, masers uh, which actually is a, an important pre step to the to the invention of lasers also and of course there are many other uh, sources which i have also consulted which i am going to uh, cite in my show notes so please do have a look at those uh, references uh, which are equally interesting so uh, who are the key players uh, in this story uh, first and the foremost is uh, as i mentioned charles towns who uh, was uh, at uh, columbia university when this whole action was happening he is uh, a scholar and an outstanding experimentalist and has a deep knowledge of physics he is the an inventor of the masers uh, which is a microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation and uh, to quote his uh, one of his famous student robert boyd uh, quote after graduating from caltech towns joined the technical staff of bell telephone laboratories in murray hill new jersey where he worked on the development of radar methods as part of second world war effort in 1948 he joined the faculty of columbia university in new york city his wartime work on radar had given him crucial knowledge in microwave methods and in 1951 while sitting on a park bench in washington dc he conceived the maser which is the microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation stop quote so uh, robert boyd whom i just quoted himself is a celebrated uh, optical physicist who has written a very famous book on uh, nonlinear optics and uh, he describes uh, charles towns as a scholar and uh, also 
uh in in this particular article uh, in which he wrote uh, as a part of the obituary of uh, charles towns he describes him as an outstanding scientist with very deep knowledge of uh, uh, experiments and also theoretical aspects of physics which played such a critical role uh, in his uh, in his career and which served him very well up to the age of 99 okay so charles towns was active up to the age of 99 where he started off with great interest in microwaves then into optics and he started using this knowledge of masers and lasers and applied to uh, astronomy and astrophysics and uh, ended up doing some fascinating work uh, which is still uh, uh, very highly regarded one to date so uh, he was a faculty in uh, columbia university first as an associate professor and he became a professor uh, roughly around 1950s and uh, later on he uh, served as an executive director of the columbia radiation laboratory in 1950 and a chairman of the physics department in columbia university so to give you a kind of a picture columbia university during his time had 10 nobel laureates in the physics department <laughs> and uh, there were future 10 more nobel laureates from that particular department who had an affiliation uh, as a student or as a former postdoc or something like that Uh, so columbia university physics department is one of the most reputed uh, physics departments in the world and it has had a great reputation for experimental physics and uh, if you look up their history it's it's quite fascinating so charles towns also was very influential which means that he played a very strong role in uh, various different committees etc and you will see that uh, going in future how that played a very critical role he was uh, uh, also a vice president and the director of research at an institute of uh, defense analysis in washington dc uh, which essentially is a part of us government and uh, was also operated by uh, 11 uh, universities so he, he he held very crucial positions in in uh, us administration uh, assisting them with uh, science and technology consultancy etc So in 1961 um, uh, Charles Towns was uh, uh, appointed as provost and professor of physics at uh, MIT uh, and uh, as provost uh, he shared the president's uh, responsibility uh, and also supervised the institute uh, on various different issues in 1966 he moved uh, to uh, to to the uh, the famous uh, University of California Berkeley circa 1967 or so where uh, he uh, finished his particular position at MIT and moved to University of California Berkeley where he uh, continued to uh, do his research all his life and uh, also was part of the space science uh, laboratory and he worked until the uh, age of 99 so this is the just the background of Charles Towns whom you will uh, listen to uh, 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 or listen about uh, quite a bit in this particular podcast the next person who played a extremely important role and uh, was also a kind of a, a, a kind of a genius was uh, theodore maimon maimon uh, uh, was uh, an electronics engineer okay uh, and he started his career as an electronics engineer but he was also equally interested in physics he applied to stanford three times uh, almost two and a half times he got rejected the last time he got rejected he went back to stanford in person and requested them to take him in and finally he uh, kind of uh, convinced them to take him uh, as a student and he became a phd student of william lamb okay of the fame of lamb shift whom uh, we celebrate in quantum mechanics which also led to the uh, important uh, uh, implications in quantum electrodynamics and other areas uh, the lamb experiment on hydrogen uh, is still one of the most important benchmarks uh, which led to some groundbreaking research in uh, quantum electrodynamics so theodore maimon uh, 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 later on uh, after finishing his uh, phd at stanford uh, moves to uh, hughes research lab uh, which is uh, a, a research laboratory in california and uh, that is where he plays a very critical role uh, in in the invention of lasers um, as a person maimon was very driven and uh, very competitive although he was uh, working in a not so famous laboratory as you will see because their competitors were ibm especially bell laboratories 
which actually was one of the you know largest industrial research laboratory during the cold war period and uh, mime actually have bet all of these big guys uh, to go on to invent lasers in a fascinating uh, way the third person whom i want to mention about is a very fascinating character uh, and also a rebellious character which is called who is called as gordon gold uh, gordon gold uh, uh, was a old phd by the conventional standards because he was doing his phd even when he was around 37 or something like that and he was a free spirit uh, very rebellious and he also had problems uh, uh, in in you know working properly because he could not finish any specific project but uh, he was also very mercurial he could do stuff in very creative way and was also kind of a brilliant in his own way and uh, unfortunately he was uh, uh, kind of uh, you know uh, put into a very lot of uh, problematic situation because of the fact that he had an association with the uh, leftist politics and uh, during the cold war era uh, there was a mccarthyian principle where uh, a lot of people had to suffer and gordon gold uh, had to uh, face a lot of security clearance problems which drastically affected his patents because uh, ultimately he was one of the first persons to actually file a patent for lasers and gordon gold was the person who coined the name lasers and uh, there was a lot of politics and uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, internal academic uh, fights which led to uh, some very uh, kind of uh, nasty patent wars uh, but uh, interestingly after 30 years of fighting gordon gold uh, um, ended up winning some of the battles and uh, it also kind of financially benefited him and uh, gordon gold is the person who coined the name lasers uh, that is an important uh, point i would want to make the next person is uh, arthur shallow uh, who actually was one of the most important players in this whole business uh, because uh, of the fact that he played a critical role in formulating the problem of lasers he was a postdoc of charles towns interestingly uh he later on went on to marry his sister charles towns sister and uh, therefore he had to quit that particular position because uh, of the university rules that uh, you cannot uh, have a kind of personal relationship with uh, with people whom you are working and uh, he was a postdoc with towns and later on he moved to bell laboratories arthur shallow was also a fascinating character with great sense of humor and also he had a very uh, kind of keen uh, ear for jazz music and uh, he it seems to have held a lot of records of uh, jazz music and uh, apart from all these things he went on to win a nobel prize in a different uh, or a kind of a related area in 1981 for high precision optical spectroscopy and uh, his intuition uh, also played a critical role although a, a very interesting mistake he did Uh, went on to actually create some very interesting consequences on the way laser uh, was invented in future and i'm going to mention a little bit about that there are also uh, some interesting uh, kind of contributions from russian side two people uh, played a very critical role one was alexander uh, porkarov uh, and uh, nikolai basov Uh, both of them were at the pn lebedev uh, physical institute in moscow uh, ussr now of course it's in russia and uh, these two gentlemen also shared the nobel prize in 1964 with charles towns for the masers and uh, uh, microwave amplifiers and uh, other uh, inventions and discoveries so interestingly Ch- charles towns perkarov and basov got the nobel prize although uh, many people think that theodor maimon deserved a nobel prize and uh, also arthur shallow was equally kind of deserving for some of the concepts he developed uh, as i mentioned arthur shallow uh, went on to win the nobel prize for a different uh, kind of work nevertheless his contribution for the development of laser uh, was very very important now what you will also see in this particular story is that there is an intense race to develop uh, uh, lasers uh it is also a, a very interesting uh, story where the tenacity knowledge great experimental skills competition conflicts between researchers and blame game 
uh, it is essentially a human drama of the highest kind so to speak uh, just that it is played in the reality and it is played by this uh, wonderful researchers if you notice also all of them are men by the way uh, this is a typical uh, kind of situation in uh, united states of america in 1960s where most of the scientific uh, aspects especially in physics was dominated by uh, by uh, men and uh, most of the academic positions were held by men and uh, that is not the situation right now but uh, the situation back then was uh, was very different from what it is now okay so uh, one can ask what was it like to be part of this particular race okay <clears throat> so jeff heck and mentions uh, uh, very interestingly uh, to quote him none of them scientists knew how they stood in the laser race unlike athletes running on a track the scientists trying to build the first laser couldn't glance around to see who was ahead or behind they had to wait for others to report their progress publicly or privately and scientists are thought to be cautious about that they are supposed to check and double check their results to make sure all details are right stop quote so what uh, jeff hecht is telling is that there is a lot of a kind of competition during that particular time and uh, a lot of people were very cautious they were trying to see who gets the priority and this race turned out to be a very very intense uh, in that particular period of time so we are talking roughly about 1950s uh, mid to late 1950s to early 1960s this this is the real action time because uh, that is when the great inventions happen related to lasers because this is also predating the maser uh, uh, invention which was uh, done by charles towns as i'm going to describe all these things could have not happened without enormous support from uh, from the us government okay that is something which is very interesting so uh, there is a very interesting paragraph in jeff heck book and i would like to quote the pentagon wanted a new generation of weapons deeply unsettled by the 1957 sputnik launch the eisenhower administrator administration created the advanced research project agency arpa now darpa to uh, invest in high risk high payoff research that other military research agencies had been unwilling to support soon after arpa opened its door its first director roy johnson told congress he would fund anything that might reduce the threat of nuclear attack even death rays uh, when trg asked which was a company asked for uh, $300,000 to try and build a laser using uh, a specific idea arpa instead gave them $999,000 which is close to a million dollars hoping for application in target designation and communication as well as in missile defense stop code so you can see the the fact that russians had already taken a dominant position in creating sputnik really set the uh, cat among the pigeons in the in the us administrator uh, administration so they really wanted to go ahead and create a huge amount of research and they could uh, claim their dominance in scientific research and th- please remember that this is around 1960s so this is all culminating towards uh, you know apollo mission also where the uh, they indeed actually show a great kind of resilience and also remarkable achievement uh, in in these uh, in, the, in that particular decade so during that period people were also aware that there is huge amount of money which was uh, spent so as uh, jeff fact also mentions Uh, a cynic redefined masers as means for acquisition of support for expensive research stop quote <laughs> so you can see people are making fun of uh, masers uh, because um, it, 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 they're calling it as a means to really acquire huge amount of uh, expensive money or uh, expensive uh, equipment and other things for the support of uh, their own uh, kind of uh, scientific research nevertheless this is all uh, turning out to be a very important kind of an investment and uh, the uh, benefits what come out uh, is is quite quite uh, uh, tremendous okay <clears throat> now let's let's try to understand the history behind the development of laser okay uh, again uh, there's a wonderful uh, uh, re- uh, kind of review article by jeff hack 
uh, titled short history of laser development uh, in optical engineering and also this is uh, printed in applied optics which is part of uh, optical society of america so the history goes uh, in terms of the timelines uh, the major kind of uh, idea which uh, gave to an important thought process was albert einstein's uh, proposal of stimulated emission in 1916 So this was a crucial idea because uh, the way light interacts with matter can give rise to three important kind of uh, interactions one is the absorption the second one is the spontaneous emission the third one is a special kind of emission which is a stimulated emission and this third one is what is crucial for uh, realizing uh, uh, lasing and uh, that played a very critical role so the idea theoretical idea was mainly from einstein and uh, most of the textbooks uh, kind of related to lasers will give you this uh, beautiful kind of uh, uh, principle behind the light matter interaction so as soon as the 1916 uh, proposal was made uh, within 15 years uh, exactly to to be exact 1928 there was an indirect evidence of stimulated emission uh, which was reported by rudolf landenberg uh, which played a interesting uh, kind of uh, role in identifying some experimental systems and uh, they could see that there is some kind of uh, notion towards this uh, stimulated emission so it was not very easy to do these experiments uh, so to speak So 1940 the light amplification by stimulated emission is proposed interestingly in a phd thesis by a russian student called as valentin fabricant who uh later on does not get much of uh, uh, you know fame but uh, nevertheless his phd thesis had some very interesting and crucial ideas uh, related to the spontaneous emission and the stimulated emission process in 1951 Edward Purcell and Robert Pound okay Edward Purcell of the fame of uh, magnetic resonance who went on to win a Nobel prize also at Harvard actually came up with stimulated emission of radio waves okay this was an important uh, kind of uh, observation although they did not go ahead and uh, look at the um, the maser or a laser kind of a concept uh, until the future progress was made around that time 1954 Charles Townes and James Gordon uh, produced the first microwave maser at 24 gigahertz at Columbia University. That was an extremely important breakthrough. Charles Townes was the main person who really came up with the idea and the principle behind uh, the microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation where he really thought about this sitting in a particular park in Washington DC and um, the story goes that uh, he was kind of uh, not getting kind of a, a clarity of how the project was going so he we- he goes out of his room and sits uh, on a bench uh, at a park which is close by and uh, the thought process actually evolves and uh, uh, lo and behold he gets this wonderful idea of uh, using some specific kind of resonators to amplify the microwaves and that's how the idea of microwave uh, uh, masers actually come into picture so towns uh, starts also investigating uh, about optical analog analog of masers which is he used to call it as optical masers and you will see that connotation uh, uh, kind of used extensively roughly in uh, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, roughly around summer of 1957 so Towns also talks to Gordon Gould uh, who is a PhD student in the Columbia department about optical pumping and optical masers so they just have a, some kind of an interaction but they don't work together because uh, Towns did not have very great impression on Gordon Gould and Gordon Gould uh, himself was not very comfortable with people with uh, you know high office and other things as i mentioned he was a kind of a rebellious character now uh, around november 1957 gold uh, coins the word laser and uh, crucially uh, in his notebook proposes the fabry perot resonator uh, which is a crucial element of uh, the lasing uh, cavity that uh, goes on to play a very critical role in uh, a lot of uh, important kind of uh, uh, applications and also the uh, instrumentation what is uh, uh, been utilized so 
in 1958 uh, towns and uh, arthur shallow whom i mentioned by the way shallow is the uh, brother in law of towns published detailed paper in phys- physical review on uh, the topic called as optical masers okay and uh, cr- the roughly around uh, a year from that uh, the arpa gives this almost uh, 1 million uh, contract and uh, remember this is 1959 or so they are really giving 9990 or 9990000 dollars which is quite a lot of money for that particular period and uh, this is given to a particular industry where uh, gordon glowd uh, is proposing the ideas in that particular uh, region and the most important crucial breakthrough happens in may 6 on may 16 1960 when uh, theodor maimon demonstrates a ruby laser at hughes research laboratory i should mention that hughes research laboratory was not that well known compared to let's say bell labs or ibm and other places nevertheless uh, theodor maimon really makes this enormous breakthrough which uh, which is a very crucial factor which i'm going to describe also how it uh, went on to play a critical role there are also other important uh, landmarks for example very soon helium neon laser was um, invented by ali jawan william bennett and uh, donald hiriot at uh, bell labs uh, they pr- produced the first continuous wave lasers uh, this was in uh, december of 1960 or so uh, which played a very important role and uh, within 2 uh, years or so from then uh, the f- red helium neon laser was invented by, uh, by alan white and dane uh, rigden in again in bell laboratories and crucially these uh, helium neon lasers which we generally use in let's say supermarket and other places this is the one which is uh, extremely well kind of uh, uh, publicized and uh, it's uh, it is prevalent everywhere this 1962 laser is what is extensively used across in supermarkets and various different places uh, that's the most important laser uh, in terms of uh, manufacturing and production and other things so this is kind of a basic timeline history of all these things there is so many important details but uh, what i'm going to mainly emphasize about is uh, some crucial moments uh, in uh, as a process uh, of uh, laser was being uh, invented first is the real moment of the uh, the uh, the invention of laser Uh, Jeff uh, Hecht mentions quote by slipping a small ruby rod inside the coil of a photographic flash lamp and enclosing the assembly in a reflective cylinder he focused intense pump light into the ruby rod he tested his design on may 16 1960 by gradually increasing the voltage applied to the flash lamp until the pulses of red light grew sharply brighter and their time and spectral profiles showed the change expected from a laser stop quote this is actually the first time anybody observed lasing okay of course masers were already there but lasers as i mentioned in the beginning uh, is the light equivalent which is in the f- visible frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum and therefore this is one of the most crucial elements of uh, the the invention of uh, lasers and may 16 1960 uh, is 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 a remarkable date for that particular event now one of the important uh, technical aspect is that the utility of flash lamp okay a uh, lot of ideas which were floating around including from uh, the uh, school of uh, charles towns arthur shallow and other people in bell labs they were all mainly focusing on gas laser based uh, systems meaning they were trying to achieve lasing from a gas which was present or kind of confined in a particular cavity whereas theodor maimon broke that particular kind of view point and uh, brought in the ruby uh, which is essentially uh, a, a solid state material in which chromium is doped inside a particular solid now interestingly arthur shallow who was also a crucial collaborator of uh, charles stones kept on mentioning that ruby will not work so this is a kind of input he has been giving across various different conferences and also within their group and therefore uh, the uh, all across the, uh, the america whomsoever is trying to produce a laser are not taking up ruby as a serious kind of a, 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 a serious kind of a material for production of laser but uh, theodor maimon had different thoughts because he had very good experience having worked in ruby 
but what is the crucial element is the utility of uh, the flash lamps so as uh, as jeff hecht uh, mentions quote chromium atoms in ruby absorb violet blue and green light so they need a light source with a high black body temperature maimon calculated the requirement of a ruby laser was roughly around 4700 degree celsius that looked discouragingly high uh, until he realized that black body temperature of photographic flash lamps could reach about 7700 degree celsius that made the xenon photographer's flash lamp looked very good stop quote this is the importance of the flash lamps because a lot of people who are using an external source could not reach this very high temperature in order to reach the high temperature you need to have an external source why is this this is because if you are now creating something called as light amplification by stimulated of emission of radiation you are trying to take atoms or some kind of uh, systems which are emitting light from a ground state to a, a higher energy state when you make this particular transition you need to pump energy and the way you are doing this is through some kind of an optical perturbation or some kind of an optical illumination so that kind of illumination is usually called as optical pumping so when you have this pump it increases the temperature of the system it takes to the non equilibrium condition and that results in something called as population inversion which means that the population of the higher energy state is much larger compared to the lower energy state and uh, what is the genius of uh, maimon is that uh, he used this flash lamp which could produce this high temperature to create this situation and uh, after that the system relaxes back to the ground state and then emits the so called uh, stimulated emission uh, of radiation and this is a very crucial kind of uh, uh, crucial kind of observation by maimon because uh, without that the the bottleneck could have not been breached and uh, which turned out to be a very important uh, kind of uh, uh, discovery what he made so the crucial aspect also jeff uh, heck mentions uh, in how uh, maimon worked when compared to his uh, counterparts that is also an equally important thing for us to realize uh, to quote him a laser excited with a flash lamp inevitably would be pulsed because it could produce stimulated emission only in the uh, instant after the lamp's brief flashes had inverted the population of chromium atoms no one else in the laser race was seriously working on pulsed lasers they generally envisioned um, optical lasers as type of oscillators which produced steady signals at lower fixed frequencies so they were trying to produce a steady optical oscillation it was an important difference but maimon decided it wasn't a major problem his first goal was to demonstrate laser operation and pulse uh, would be sufficient to show a laser could work besides as with flash lamps pulse beams might serve different purposes than steady ones stop quote this was a very important difference because all of the people who are trying to produce lasers were essentially utilizing a technique which was based on conventional optical means of excite, uh, excitation of this optical pumping whereas maimon used this flash lamp which really played a very important role by the way his setup did not have very kind of costly elements but the way he brought things together and uh, put them into particular kind of assembly is the sheer genius of this particular uh, invention so when he realized that lasing was happening he had to qualitatively measure some parameters like pulse shortening and line narrowing to indicate that there is indeed a breach of threshold and he took care of all the details and uh, he then went ahead and tried to publish this result now what is interesting is once he decided to publish his results there was an interesting saga and it is a saga where if you want to really publish something which is very cutting edge and if it also has some applications the conservative physics physics community was not open to look at this particular idea especially in the celebrated journal of physical review letters and the uh, the editor in chief of that journal was samuel goldsmith a traditional physicist who is also very well known physicist but uh, he had this roadblock of pure versus applied research 
which drastically affected uh, mindman's uh, publication uh, procedure as you can see and jeff heck very nicely mentions this his manuscript passed shif- uh, swiftly through the huge chain of command but the company's patent department didn't see anything r- worth filing later costing huge any shot at overseas patents so even the patents were not increased again to continue the quote on june 22nd 1916 mayman airmailed it to physical review letters the country's leading journal for reporting hot research in physics so he continues to say what god smith did to quote trained in academic tradition of pure physics samuel god smith had the attitude that fundamental physics was more important than applications it was a common attitude among prominent members of physics establishment and god smith's eminence and central position at the physics society gave him serious clout he had strong opinions and was not afraid to voice them recalls uh, ben bradston who later uh, later became uh, uh, editor in chief of american physical society so young physicists found him to be a rather domineering figure goldsmith had little patience for nonsense and a broad definition of what constituted it stop quote so goldsmith as you can see has very strong opinions he thinks that um, there are too many papers which are published on masers and uh, laser is just a extrapolation of uh, masers so therefore there is no new physics in it and therefore it is not important and this is the thought process at that particular point of time you know this is actually one of the bane of uh, some of the traditional physics uh, people especially of the ester years where they did not really give a lot of emphasis on applications and you could see that uh, american physical society journals held this viewpoint for a reasonably long period of time only in the last decade or so they have changed their position and suddenly they have woken up that uh, applications are equally important and therefore optics and other areas have now turned out to be equally important and fashionable nowadays anyway so jeff smith also mentions how uh, uh, gauch smith really played a critical role in blocking that particular paper and uh, he also mentions that obviously goldsmith did not understand the implication because he was an outstanding physicist it's not like he did not understand the physics it's just that he was dismissive of anything which is kind of application oriented nevertheless what mainman did was uh, once he his paper was rejected one uh, physical review letters he sent it to nature okay <laughs> then nature was not as reputed as physrev letters especially for the physics community so to speak and uh, nature readily published his uh, work uh, and uh, this uh, very crucial paper was accepted uh, and was scheduled for uh, august 6th uh, 1960 and the title of this famous paper is stimulated optical radiation in ruby and uh, later on uh, mayman wrote a longer article in journal of applied physics which is an equally great journal very uh, very nice journal for applied physics articles and uh, that got a lot of attention uh, from the community although i should mention that uh, the big players like charles towns and the bell laboratory researchers did not uh, want to give too much credit to uh, theodor mayman because he was not in the gang so to speak he was not one among them and uh, there was a huge investment by pentagon and various different uh, industries and also us government uh, to really produce this and here you have a person who was not that well known really making this important breakthrough and that was a kind of a shocker for for the whole community and uh, this has some very impl- uh, intense implications because you can see now charles towns and shallow are the main dominant figures then who are really controlling the uh, the narrative so to speak because they insist that one should always call anything which is now called as lasers as optical masers that is because maser was an idea of charles towns and therefore everybody had to follow his diktat so to speak of calling anything in the optical regime regime as optical masers so some people like gold and mayman did not obey that particular policy they took a different route and they started calling their uh, invention as lasers and that had its own interesting implication so during that time uh, there was a lot of uh, media attention to this invention obviously because there is uh, a lot of money involved in it and uh, some of the uh, kind of media outlets called it uh, us vic- victor in world quest of coherent light 
and um, there was a lot of uh, media attention given to the to to the invention there's a very famous photograph of theodore maimon holding uh, the prototype of the laser in front of his face and that is a very famous uh, uh, picture you will find if you type anywhere as a inventor of laser and things like that so during that time um, the uh, maimon tells that uh, 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 i am holding uh, only a prototype uh, and uh, why don't i use a, a normal uh, laser which i have really invented so the photographer uh, tells it seems to him uh, you do the science and i do the picture <laughs> so this is the legend uh, uh, in from the from the literature okay this is the kind of basic background and history behind this uh, very important um, invention uh, let me pay a little bit more attention to the characters uh, in this whole game uh, first and the foremost is the charles towns as i mentioned he was a scholarly person very deep knowledge of physics he obtained his phd in caltech and uh, his phd advisor was student of albert michelson so that great tradition of uh, you know optics uh was uh, was still running in uh, in uh, laboratory of charles towns and many of his students became outstanding uh, researchers who are still doing great work as i mentioned uh, one of the people is uh, a very famous person is uh, uh, robert boyd and there are so many people who have done uh, great work with uh, charles towns among them uh, elsa grammer uh, who was a, uh, a woman phd student uh, her first woman phd student uh, wrote a very beautiful uh, obituary in nature photonics and uh, she quotes he was low key but insistent raised in the south with the air of southern gentleman he had a great deal of patience with people but he would be steadfast in his own point of view i witnessed a visitor discussing a new idea he had with towns i could instantly see the flaw in his thinking but towns didn't say a word he asked him uh mild mannered questions that slowly got the visitor to see the error in his own thinking it was an excellent lesson in how to be motivating teacher towns assumed the best in everyone which was important to me because i was insecure as the only female in my mit phd physics class as his first female phd student i was constantly worried about my ability to live up to expectations it helped however that towns had three daughters stop quote so you can see she also uh, mentions that he was a very kind person there is a lot of things to learn from him he also was very clear in thinking and explaining and that is something she mentions in her uh, uh, obituary article too she played a very important role in stimulated raman stimulated brilva and other kind of optical processes which are at the heart of uh, various uh, light matter interaction processes so towns was a very dominant uh, character and also played a very critical role in uh, various different uh, things related to not only masers and lasers but also applied these concepts to astrophysics uh, that is something fascinating about him and he was uh, very active until uh, he passed away at the age of 99 the next character is uh, gordon good you know uh, this is a person uh, jeff uh, hecht mentions in his book very beautifully and also his relationship with uh, uh, towns is uh, mentioned very nicely uh, quote to the intensely focused towns gaud seems lazy undisciplined and irresponsible a mediocre student trying to take credit for other people's idea when he couldn't settle down to finish his own dissertation to the free spirited gaud towns was a pillar of establishment that he had learned the hard way not to trust each man knew that he had conceived of the laser idea so it was natural for each to suspect the other had stolen it stop quote so you can see the ideas which were floating around was common to both these gentlemen and each of them did not trust the other and this really created a lot of uh, kind of bad blood between them unfortunately i should mention uh, that uh, gold actually had uh, a lot of problem in security clearance as i mentioned uh it later became uh, clear it seems that uh, fbi also had tapped his phone uh, in 1940s this was even before uh he really became a phd student because he had uh, uh left his kind of leaning and uh, other kind of associations and uh, there was a lot of suspicion on him which was which was later kind of cleared later on for a, after a long period of time 
post mccarthyian kind of era and things like that uh this really affected gordon good because you know he could not uh, apply for the patent because his security clearances were not given for the fact that he were he was getting uh, funding from the us government especially from the defense because of his uh, security clearance not going through he was not able to publish his uh, patents and that is a very crucial roadblock for him and uh, he had to really you know fight a 30 year patent uh, war although he could apply for patents outside us but the us uh, itself did not open up to him for a long period of time later on he won the battle and he also made a lot of money it seems but uh, he did not get the credit which was probably deserving to certain extent because some of the crucial ideas the key uh, uh, aspect of acronym of laser was also given by him and uh, the re- fabry perot resonator ideas and other things were also kind of envisaged by him the third person is maimon uh, and uh, he also played a very important role he uh, also has a beautiful uh, kind of uh, memoir the laser inventor and uh, uh, maimon also had a, l- a not so good relationship with charles towns so for example in his memoir in page 145 he mentions more recently the american uh, physical society set up a website with a uh, recitation of important technological de- de- developments of 20th century i was contacted to provide a picture of the first laser i submitted the picture but was aghast when i saw the context in which it was put i was listed under the construction of laser the major was listed with credit to towns for laser development where is the laser that towns developed <laughs> he is asking the aps presentation is of course incorrect as the writing the website on the aps timeline continues to be as i have described it and yes charles towns is a past president of the aps top court so you can see there is a bit of uh, you know open kind of bad blood between uh, him and charles towns because charles towns was very dominant and also establishment man very uh, kind of uh, influential in policy also with the government so there a lot of people were uh, uh, were having some kind of uh, an issue with uh, with with him and maimon was one of them uh, unfortunately the other character who is very kind of you know uh, fascinating and who also went uh, went on to win a nobel prize in 1981 is art shallo and uh, he has some very interesting sense of humor so i'll just tell you uh, during a particular conference uh, he uh, mentions that an optical oscillator was really light oscillator by stimulated ra- uh, emission of radiation so shallow duly noted making it the acronym loser instead of laser <laughs> so light oscillation by stimulated emission of radiation if you take the acronym it becomes loser instead of light amplification so art shallow was making fun of that particular concept he also was a, a, a kind of um, not taken to a hype uh, whenever there is one especially he was always interested in basic uh, spectroscopy than preparing devices but he really played a very crucial role in making uh, lasers so in his lab uh, art shallow saw uh, an article in the newspaper which was very kind of you know uh bombastic in terms of the capabilities of laser and all and therefore what he did he taped a copy of that particular article uh, uh in front of his door at the stanford university with a note saying for credible lasers see inside <laughs> okay so he's really making fun of the stuff which is uh, really there uh in 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 the media which is really hyping up things uh, and uh, putting things in a slightly more broader context which need not be highly accurate okay so that brings us to uh, kind of towards the end of this particular podcast where uh, we have discussed about the fascinating and gripping history of uh, laser invention the inference what we can draw essentially is that uh, humans are inherently curious and competitive there is also a lot of different ways in which you can do good science that is an important uh, take away from this and from goudsmith and maimon's uh, interaction we can also see that uh, discrimination between pure and applied sciences is not a good strategy for uh, science or technology uh, it is important to actually have a viewpoint where these things are looked at as a continuum uh, within the framework of knowledge uh, kind of development 
and it is very important to also observe that uh, funding is so important to really come up with this kind of important breakthroughs you could see that the uh, us government poured a lot of money to really come up with uh, very interesting ideas they encouraged a lot of people with fundamental uh, theoretical uh, uh, you know principles and ideas and went uh, and many of them went on to even hold patents theoretical physicists uh, had uh, patents and that was an important kind of way of encouraging people to really uh, go through uh, the process of taking ideas and making them uh, useful for some particular translation based research and uh, other things so this also is a beautiful story of how the evolution of ideas uh, where something uh, even charles towns mentions that he was no way thinking about anything as an application if you read his memoirs he exactly mentions that he was always interested in the basic curiosity driven question but nobody can deny today that lasers are one of the most important applications in uh, coming out of uh, a, a particular physics discovery or invention so therefore uh, it is very crucial for us to appreciate that basic sciences curiosity based thinking coupled with very intuitive way of putting that particular idea into practice uh, is very critical it also highlights that how important experimental kind of research is because uh, if you have only theoretical ideas and if they are not realized one would not be able to take it to to fruition and make it into a, let's say something which is very useful to the public but nobody can do everything which means that some specific people would be interested in some part of this particular development and uh, each of each part is very important and uh, therefore uh, encouraging people to do every aspect of of research right from the f- ideas theoretical kind of evaluation experimental verification engineering and prototyping and marketing and uh, making it into translation into the into the public domain has its own kind of uh, you know challenges and opportunities and therefore uh, it is an truly a, a endeavor where all humanity has to participate in uh, making good ideas come into come into life so this is the gripping history of uh, invention of laser and uh, i hope uh, you people are also enjoying the podcast uh as i mentioned uh, th- this podcast is uh, non commercial so please uh, feel free to kind of share it with anybody who is interested in science and also encourage people to uh, take science as an important part of their lives and that is the most important message i generally have as part of my podcast and of course i do give a lot of uh, citations uh, and uh, references as part of the show notes i uh, request you to refer to all things what i have been talking about if you're really interested you can go deep into the 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 papers and also the books which i generally refer to and there's a fascinating amount of knowledge which is uh, waiting to be discovered by you and also by me so thank you again and see you next time